Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Primetime Pards, our fourth edition, this one for the month of October. And we say hello to all of you and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, tonight, our guest is Amanda Magadan, class of 2017, obviously one of the greatest field hockey players Lafayette has ever had, and she has taken that talent to become a member of the U.S. women's national team. So we can't wait to chat with Amanda. But before that, if you've been with us before, you kind of know the rules and regulations. But let me just remind those who perhaps are joining us for the first time. For optimal viewing of tonight's show, changing the speaker view right now is strongly recommended. To ensure the best possible experience for everyone tonight, the microphones of all attendees will be muted. During the audience Q&A portion of the show, please utilize the raise your hand feature, which can be found by opening participants. All right, those are all the rules. We're ready to go. And as we always do, we like to start the show off with Lafayette's Director of Athletics. Here is Sharita Freeman. Thank you, Gary, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of our participants and a sincere thank you for joining us tonight. Um, this is our fourth installment of Primetime Cards. They have all been phenomenal, and tonight will no doubt um, stick to that trend. Um, so I am excited um, to hear from our special guest tonight. Um, to introduce our primetime card for today, I'd like to welcome the reigning Patriot League Coach of the Year in her eighth year here at Lafayette, head coach for field hockey, Jennifer Stone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sharita, and the rest of the athletic department for uh, kind of putting on these primetime cards. It's been great to hear the stories and legacies of the former Leopards and certainly the impact they're having within each of their uh scope of reach. Uh, it's my incredible honor to be able to share with you Amanda Magadan, uh, a member of the Lafayette Field Hockey Class of 2017. Many know Amanda because of her time on the women's national team. As a member of the national team, Amanda and her teammates have chosen to put themselves in residency in order to compete to be a world contender and ultimately earn a trip to the Olympic Games. She's a full-time athlete, a full-time competitor, and there truly are no off days. Although Amanda is a full-time athlete, she still is a Lafayette grad. Lafayette grads are intelligent, driven, leaders, passionate problem solvers, and they're innovators. They set goals and have deadlines to achieve them in. Amanda's boardroom's just a little bit different. It's the hockey field and her performance review is determined by the scoreboard. I'm sure much of the next hour or so is gonna be about Amanda's time as one of the best in her craft. What many don't know is how Amanda got there. Amanda's first trip to Lafayette was for a field hockey clinic. She was a competitive softball player in high school and would travel all over the US for tournaments during her youth. She did it because she loved it, but then she found a new love and that was hockey. Amanda started her career at Lafayette as a player that could play anywhere. She would do anything she needed to support the team, any minutes, any position, she was ready to help. Amanda was a leader in absolutely anything she was doing. She was the standard. She was contagious, energetic, a competitor and brought people with her. This past spring and summer during our quarantine period, Amanda spoke with our team. Amanda always had a curiosity for learning and certainly continues to do so. She was consistently the one that enjoyed the extra rep, the extra set, the time alone on the field and had a curiosity just about what could be. This curiosity, extreme love for coaching and desire to keep doing what she enjoys has gotten her to the world stage. On the call, Amanda spoke about the importance of culture, the process of being elite, the need to be a competitor and the importance of preparation and performing under pressure. After the call, I asked our team for reflections and takeaways from the call. One response from a player on the team simply stated, it doesn't matter where you come from, the cream always rises to the top. Amanda's past eight years or so have been about her rise to the top. Although only at Lafayette for four years, the legacy, the tradition, and the excellence she has left behind is still here within our program. Not every coach gets an Amanda, but I'm incredibly honored to say that I have the ability to coach the passionate, magnetic, competitive, and determined number 12. 
So with that, Gary, I'll turn it over to you and enjoy the time. What a marvelous in introduction, Jen. Uh, there's not much I can add to that. Uh, obviously, Amanda on the U.S. Women's National Team in 2017, four years as a midfielder at Lafayette for the Maroon and White, all Patriot League honors three of those four years, led the team in scoring a couple of years, uh, third team All-American. Uh, so Amanda Magadan, welcome to uh, Primetime Pards. It's really good to have you here with us. And I think the first thing we need to talk about, all of us are working at home, but we're actually working at home. Home. It's hard to be a hockey, a field hockey player at home. So talk a little bit about the fact that you're alone. There's no teammates. There's no field. Uh, what you have outside your house is a pavement. Uh, so uh, talk a little bit about how you're staying in field hockey condition. Yeah, well, first off, thank you for having me, Gary and Lafayette. Um, but yeah, to that point, it's been quite interesting with everything going on with COVID and like you mentioned, us working at home. So typically we do, um, when we're in our full-time residency, we do have some time that is off. Um, and so we're kind of used to training at home, but not for this magnitude um, under these conditions. Um, so it's been super interesting getting creative. Um, I have found playing hockey on grass, um, playing hockey on my pavement, um, in the driveway, kind of wherever I can on carpet. Um, but one of the things that has been the most difficult um, in that regard is to try to get better and constantly achieve some type of growth um, while playing hockey at home. And for me, that has been playing hockey on my driveway. And um, it's funny. And I understand that I'm, I'm super fortunate that I have a sponsor, but if you look, I have two specific sticks um, that I dedicate to purely training on um, my driveway. And they literally look like hockey sticks at this point, like um, ice hockey sticks, because they're just grinded down to the max. And um, I, again, I'm very fortunate that I have a sponsor that I can just send me sticks um, when I need them. But I feel like that for me has been one of the most difficult things um, is not having access to AstroTurf. Um, there's plenty of field turfs down the road, but uh, the quality of the surface for field hockey is so important. So um, that's probably been one of the biggest struggles. I can assume you've explained this to all your neighbors because I look out the window and see this goofy person just out there with a hockey stick probably wouldn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, even that, um, aside from that, even just like running, they're like, why are you always setting up cones <laughs> and like doing sprint workouts outside? They think I'm crazy, but. <laughs> That's the way it has to be, right? Yeah. Got I know it. you're also, you're also working with a spin instructor. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, so I recently um, auditioned to become a spin instructor. So I haven't started yet, but I'm super, super excited. I think, um, Spin is obviously fun because it's a workout, but um, it just is a high energy fitness class. And I'm really excited to, you know, try something new and um, kind of use my contagious energy in that light. Being someone not used to fitness at all, I'm just <laughs> wondering exactly what a uh, spin instructor uh, teaches. What, do you, what is spinning all about? Well, so different studios kind of have different setups where some classes are super competitive and numbers driven. Um, but the class that I would be looking to teach is what they call like a ride class. Um, and it's more like moving to the beat. So you kind of like pedal to the beat of the songs. Um, and then the instructor will give you like a routine to do. You'll do push ups or crunches. Um, so as an instructor, I have to plan all of that out, come up with the routine, put the songs together and try to make it fun for you. So you're staying super active no matter what, what the circumstances. Yeah, I try to. <laughs> all right, well, let's, let's go back a little bit in your life. Let's go back to high school. Uh, Randolph, New Jersey is where you went to high school, Randolph High School. Mm -hmm. uh, and softball was your love, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I grew up playing softball. I that was the first sport I picked up, um, that and soccer kind of at the same time. And my dad kind of tricked me into really getting into softball. He was like, if you make the travel softball team, you have to try out. If you make the travel softball team, you're going to play softball. If you don't, you can play soccer. 
And lo and behold, I made the, the travel softball team. And from then on, I played softball um, all the way till high school. And um, I, you know, my weekends were consumed with softball tournaments. I would travel out to Colorado, up and down the East Coast, um, my summers, everything, missing bar and bat mitzvahs. Um, I was always at the softball field, um, whether it was a tournament or just kind of with my dad. So I grew up, um, that was kind of what my plan and um, expectation was that I was going to play division one softball. And those were kind of where my aspirations um, were. And then I kind of picked up field hockey in high school. I quite honestly didn't even know field hockey was a sport or existed um, prior to freshman year. And I just remember um, in eighth grade, there being a like orientation on freshman field hockey. And I very much enjoyed sports. High school would be the first time that I got to play um, any other sport um, besides softball since I was very young. Um, so I kind of took it as an opportunity to embrace my love for athletics and um, to meet new friends. Um, and from then on, I made varsity and was super fortunate kind of in my development. And um, I even remember sitting down with Jennifer um, when I was um, contemplating coming to Lafayette and in the recruiting process. And I literally had asked her, like, would you allow me to be a dual sport athlete? And she actually said yes, which I think was super cool. She kind of laid out the pros and cons to, you know, being a dual sport athlete and not. And um, it was a super cool opportunity that I had in front of me. And I think actually that conversation is what pivoted me to be like, oh, I can play field hockey in college and maybe I can even do both. And then I started really looking at playing field hockey in college. Um, and from that point, it was kind of history. Then I, you know, decided I was gonna stop softball and jump two feet into field hockey. Did you ever figure out what it was about field hockey that made you give up softball? I and mean, what, what did you like more about that sport than the other? Yeah. So it's funny looking back, this is like crystal clear to me. Um, but I think for me, softball, you can, you know, I was a second baseman and you could stand out there and get one ground ball and make an error. And that kind of defined your whole game, or you got two at bats that game and, um, struck out and, and walked or something like that. And in field hockey, the ability for you to make a mistake and simply hustle back and you could define your game by this aspect of if you work hard that could be that your stamp on the game um really drew me to the sport and i think it kind of shows in um the kind of player i am and that you know i can make a mistake and oh well we're gonna work back and win the ball back or um do something else to help the team so now you have to make the decision. You have your conversation with Coach Stone and uh, you've decided what direction you're going in. Why, why, why Lafayette in the first place? I mean, it, you know, there are, there are plenty of schools out there who really have national, are nationally renowned in terms of field hockey. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure you didn't go to Lafayette expecting to be a professional field hockey player. So why Lafayette? Um, yeah, so I was kind of, because of my development, um, or me picking up a stick being kind of late, I um, ended up going to a field hockey clinic like Jennifer mentioned. And at that clinic, the head coach of Lafayette at the time was Andrew Griffiths. And he was the one who pulled me aside and was like, you, are you recruit, like, are you committed? What's going on? And um, I was like, no. And from that moment, similar to that conversation with Jennifer, I kind of was like, okay, I can play field hockey in college. So I started looking and I really looked at Lafayette and Quinnipiac and um, Lafayette just kind of had it all for me. It ha had the small class sizes. Um, it had the academic and uh, athletic excellence. Um, we just came off of two Patriot League titles. Uh, the team was super, super welcoming and um, also had this competitive drive to 
to be excellent and to get where they wanted to go. Um, and then like simple things, like it was close to home. Um, and like I said, the small class sizes really also drew me to Lafayette because I know that that's how I learn best with small class sizes. And almost everyone I talk to, uh, and I talk to many athletes, the primary driver, however, is you know you're gonna get a great education. And yeah. uh, so I assume that was also uh, part of the decision, majoring in economics and psychology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that was kind of um, always something in the back of my head. Even when I played softball, I always wanted to go to a school that um, would kind of help me achieve academic excellence. And I, I wanted to use sport kind of to get there, to get to the next level, um, and even use it as a tool to maybe get into a college that I wasn't um, as academically good at. And um, by being there and being surrounded by other individuals, it forces you to kind of rise and um, work your tail to, to get the job done and, and achieve academic excellence as well. So let's talk about some of your college experiences. Uh, I know you jotted a few down for me. Uh, you, you created a time capsule. What's that all about? Yeah, so this is super funny. Just um, when I was reflecting on kind of all the different experiences I had at Lafayette, at first, just because I've, I think I've been out three years now, um, it, I was like, what were my memories at Lafayette? Like what happened freshman year? And once you kind of like sit down to start thinking about them, they kind of just come flooding back one after the other. And one of the things from freshman year was my roommate, Kat Stevens, who was a volleyball player, her and I, um, we lived in Watson dorm and we kind of were isolated. You always wanted to be in like South roof or Easton as a freshman, just cause they're all right next to each other. And we were always up to random stuff. I would teach her how to play field hockey in the hallway, or we would do random scavenger hunts thinking we were funny. And one of the things we did at the end of the year was we created this time capsule and we wrote a letter. We included like a Hawaiian lei um, and I think a shoe and we hid it in Watson dorm. Um, so I'd be very curious to see if it's still there, but we were super nostalgic, like looking back on our freshman year and um, I think we both had a lot of personal growth, um, academic, athletic, and we were just looking back on the year, like, how are we ever going to um, kind of remember all of this? And um, we were super nostalgic about it. So, all right, well, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure everybody now is going to go out and look for that shoe, wherever, that, <laughs> wherever that happens to be. Uh, you said you fell into the under 21 development pipeline. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so this also happened um, at the end of my freshman year going into my sophomore year. And uh, it was actually at the suggestion of Jennifer um, who kind of pushed me like, why don't you do high performance? And with all of this and, you know, with me being on the women's national team, I think one of the things I'm super thankful for is that I genuinely think part of it was luck. I think a lot of it was hard work, but I think a big, big part of it um, was just things falling into place at the right time. Um, Jennifer suggested for me to go to high performance. I happened to have a teammate at the time who also wanted to do high performance Kirby. And I went with her and her mom uh, uh, to the tryout and kind of like bandwagoned. Um, then from there, I uh, made the high performance team, which again, quite honestly, I joined high performance, uh, looking to develop as a hockey player and play hockey over the summer and to not have to do as much to my fitness packet. Cause if I could play hockey and get fit that way, then I'd rather do that than stand on a line and run from cone to cone. So those were kind of my two goals going into this high performance, um, program, which ultimately leads you to the U21 team, which at the time I had no idea. Um, so I made the high performance team, went to the young women's tournament. And at the young women's tournament, I again, think I was very fortunate to be surrounded with some awesome players from other schools. And we had an awesome coach and we made it all the way to the championship. So 
just to put some things in perspective, the Young Women's Tournament is girls from all different schools who get thrown onto random teams with random coaches and they play in this tournament. And again, we were able to go to the championship. And the reason why I say that that's um, such a fortunate thing for me is because me going to the championship allowed for coaches to see me play more often and coming from Lafayette um, and not coming from an ACC or big 10 school. I think that that was super important. um, Cause quite honestly, I coaches didn't want me to make the, the U 21 team or go beyond that because I didn't come from one of those schools. So I think um, that all those fortunate events kind of, um, led me to where I am today. So I do think it, it has been hard work, but it's been a bunch of fortunate events and super supportive people like Jennifer encouraging me along the way um, and, and being so supportive and, uh, and willing to um, help me in my development and help me throughout the process. So I would assume too that planted the seed in your mind that you can play with these, what are considered the upper echelon college, uh, college players. So Uh, that seed now is planted for what then occurs later in life. Yeah. I mean, it was, I kind of was always in this like growth or coming to self phase um, in that regard, because even though I was on the U21 team in the back of my mind, I always, um, you know, did think like these girls have been playing since they were in sixth grade and they have this many years on me and they do go to a big 10 ACC school and um, I think it, it took me a while to get over that and um, build confidence into into the player I am and to know that my skills might be different than someone else. I'm not the most technical um, player, but I will outwork anyone on the field. So um, I think also having a coach like Jennifer who worked with me from my freshman year and from that point of making the U21 team all the way to my senior year to develop me as a player and to keep me in check with what I need to continue to work at, what I am good at, um, and constantly reminding me and again, providing me resources um, has certainly helped me become the person that I am. I know on campus, you were part of the Athletes Care Program, the Mm C-A-R-E program. uh, And that had an effect on you uh, as far as your academics are concerned. It also had effect on you and your personal life. So uh, talk uh, talk a little bit about Athletes Care, what that, that was all about. And then maybe mention how you just happened to kind of really like the guy who founded the program. (laughs) So we started dating before I got involved with Athletes Care, or talking, I think at the time, I don't, I'm not exactly sure with the timeline, but um, yeah, so I got involved with Athletes Care. And um, I think that that's one of the really cool things about Lafayette and specifically about the field hockey team. I know a lot of other teams are similar in that regard, but a lot of the upperclassmen were always so involved on campus. And um, quite honestly, as a freshman, sometimes you thought they were crazy because of how much they had going on and how much they were involved in. Um, But once you kind of got your footing, you were able to to also participate. And one of the things that I participated in was Athletes Care. And um, I think it was just a super cool. Um, well, it's a nonprofit founded by Alec Galini, um, class of 14. And it basically is a platform for athletes to help out in the community. And, um, I think he, he initially had the idea of doing it from service that he had participated with his family in feeding the homeless in Philadelphia. And, um, while I was a part of athletes care at Lafayette, we actually did get to, um, participate in a similar, Um, activity where we served the homeless in Philly. And it was just such a cool opportunity to see like what, how much joy someone gets from a plate of food and how fortunate we are. And it humbles you as um, an individual and, and to have a platform as athletes um, and come together to be able to do something like that, I think is super cool and speaks volumes to, um, the character of those people who are willing to go out and create that and um, is, is just, it's just, just such a rewarding experience for us as individuals, just as much as it is um, for them. And 
in addition to that, they've definitely branched out to doing other community service activities. And when I was there, I was the coordinator of the PAWS group, which stood for um, like pen pals with um, kids. And we, uh, at the time we, when I was the coordinator, we didn't, we didn't have an actual pen pal communication, but we would visit the boys and girls club in Easton and simply taking their time to go play basketball with the kids there or help them do a puzzle, uh, again, was just like so rewarding. And, um, it just, it was a really cool opportunity to be involved, um, not only on campus, but in the greater Easton community. And, uh, I guess it answered your question about how all the, these upperclassmen were, uh, were doing these things because it became a really good thing to do. Yeah. Uh, you also became rather fond of the founder, correct? <laughs> Yes, we are dating. <laughs> okay. Not just talking. No, no. <laughs> Talk a little bit about your, the, the classes at Lafayette. What, what was it about the classes, uh, about the academics, uh, the challenges, uh, the things that make Lafayette a special place? Yeah, I mean, I think, like you said, the classes can be so challenging, but they also are extremely interesting. Um, I know I was fortunate to interact and meet Professor Allen, um, and he worked in the psychology department, um, and he taught a behavioral class and then a research lab, which I participated in both. And um, we got to work with pigeons and um, teach them different things. Uh, and it was super cool to, for me, I really found an interest in learning about human behavior and animal behavior and um, all that. I don't know, that's just fascinating to me to understand um, kind of why people function the way they do and um, kind of also introspect on myself on how, why do I do certain things? Um, and there was also another class I was super fond of in the econ department which was by Professor Averett. And she taught a class called Women in the Economy. And that class was so fascinating to me. She basically applied economic principles and theories to historical concepts and showed you like, why do people marry? And um, it's, you know, the first essay she had us do was why do people marry and people are including myself writing about love or like tax write offs, maybe or all these things and then you kind of tear it apart and you know talk about economies of scale and how that um, applies to that so it, it was just a super cool course to take economic theory and apply it to something that's so relevant to all of us. It's interesting too, uh, you probably never thought of this when you started Lafayette, but what perfect uh, majors to have if you're gonna be a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. uh, psychology, uh, dealing with coaches and dealing with other players uh, and economics, uh, because you have to kind of figure out how to make a living uh, yeah. doing that. So perfect choice. I don't know how you were so well aware that all of that was going to happen. <laughs> hey, we wanna see you in action. One of the big games on campus when you were there was the uh, BU game, ranked number nine in the nation at the time. Uh, and this is the first time that Lafayette ever beat BU in their career. Uh, double overtime, shootouts. We've got video. You talk about it. Yeah, so that was such a cool game. We, I can't even really describe it. Like, when you look back on it, um, people ask, like, oh, look, even after we were debriefing and Jennifer would ask, what was different about that game? And um, we were just so focused on ourselves and nothing else. We went, we scored first, it was 1-0, and then we ended up, they, BU ended up tying it. And even in overtime, we knew, like, we have this, we're fine. Kate had an awesome game, was playing excellent. Um, and then we obviously went into shootouts. We had our um, five shootout players already selected um, and kind of, like, went to each other we we're like you got this yes we we know exactly what we're doing you know what you're doing on your shootout and um we got the job done kate had literally the best game ever and then obviously as you're watching now eliza came up big with the winning goal um and she was just super composed super confident and 
knew exactly what she wanted to do. She was going to pull right. Um, even when she got that rebound, she knew exactly what her job was and to put in the back of the net. And beating BU our senior year was just such, to some extent, a relief. Um, it's so exciting because BU came into the league our freshman year. And from that moment, they had been a powerhouse. And it was really cool to kind of accomplish this feat. You know, we kept coming so close to beating them, so close to beating them, so close to beating them. And then in our, in our senior year, being able to actually accomplish that was, was awesome. One of your best memories ever, as far as a field hockey player? Um, I have a bunch. I don't even know if it's just as a field hockey player. I think there are so many things that happened at Lafayette. We had what we had preseason at Princeton. Um, we had the change of Rapport Field and getting new uniforms. Um, even simple things like someone missing a heart rate monitor and having to run all the back to, all the way back to the locker room. Or um, this one's kind of funny, but I think it was my junior year. Our seniors, Paige and Abby, decided they were going to buy a hot tub. And they got this blow up hot tub and put it in their backyard. And their backyard was like around the corner from their house. So when we went out to the hot tub, we like, were literally like running in the streets with our robes and we thought we were so funny. And yeah, it's just like, it's simple things like that or simple memories that you're just like, what we thought we were so funny and we weren't. And it was, it's just, those are the memories that you're fond of, not necessarily, um, like a win or a loss. I mean, obviously the BU game is um, a fond memory of mine, but you kind of don't remember all of the, oh, did we beat that team my freshman year or sophomore year? Um, it's the the moments where you got to connect with your teammates, whether it was on the field or off the field, but those are the, the memories that you really look back on. Well, you kicked in a memory for me. I happened to broadcast the field hockey game the night Rappold Field was dedicated and there's not a bigger supporter of Lafayette field hockey than Bill Rappel. No, no, he is. And to this day, he's, he's such a supporter. In fact, he, he has a question already, and it's probably a good time to work it in. Uh, you're obviously a very good speaker, uh, very comfortable in front, of, uh, in front of the camera on Zoom. Uh, did, your, did your ability to speak as well as you do, did that help you in international hockey? Um. I think so because, well, we don't have to speak as elaborate, um, but I think having the confidence to be able to to talk to your teammates on the field um, is super important, and I feel like it's uh, translated in that way. Um, I will say the speed of the game is obviously quite different internationally, so sometimes processing things um, when I first was on the team was a little bit slow. Um, to then be able to communicate it. But um, certainly it, it has helped in being confident to tell someone step left, step right, we're moving up, um, drop or whatever it may be that we need at that time. Plus, I guess you're fluent in Spanish, right? <laughs> I wish, I'm Cuban. <laughs> My parents are both Cuban, but I don't know any Spanish. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, we'll be, we're gonna leave Lafayette in a moment, but you did go to Tanzania, right, as part of uh, your Lafayette experience? Yeah, so I will singly handedly say to anyone out there who's still in school, I highly, highly recommend going and studying abroad. I think that is certainly one of my fondest experiences when I look back. I, I got to go to Tanzania with Eliza Ferno, who was a member of my class. And it's actually funny when we were trying to decide where we wanted to go, because we had planned to go together. Um, I really wanted to go to Peru and see Machu Picchu. And she wanted to go to Tanzania because of the actual educational aspect and the, the program that they were um, providing was an environmental studies and looking at the sustainability um, in Tanzania. And so she kind of won. I, I said, you know, you're, you wanna get the educational piece out of this. I'm just looking at, for some fun. Um, <laughs> and we ended up we ended up going to Tanzania and it was hands down one of the coolest experiences I ever had. And I did very much enjoy 
um, learning about um, the resources and the real estate laws and government interaction um, there. And that was what the course was about. So um, also kind of funny story about Tanzania. We, we had to sleep in the middle of the Serengeti in a tent. And there's obviously wildlife out there and um we were sleeping and I Eliza woke me up because there's a buffalo outside our tent who's grinding its horn on the post of the tent and I'm like oh yeah I'm scared whatever and then I just fall asleep and start snoring and Eliza whacks me awake and is like this buffalo is gonna come and kill us if you don't be quiet so um looking back, it's just, it's super funny to be like, oh, we are snoring and while well, a buffalo was outside. So that was, it was again, once in a lifetime experience. I don't think I'll ever be snoring when there's a buffalo that close to me ever again. So. <laughs> You're probably absolutely correct. <laughs> uh, all right. It's time to, it's time to become a professional field hockey player. Uh, Kate Arnold uh, sent me a, a request and it's a really interesting question. So as many of your current USA teammates played collegially at some of the top athletic institutions. You alluded to this when you went to your U21 camp mm -hmm. for both field hockey and sports in general, North Carolina, Maryland, Penn State, et cetera, all great field hockey schools. How did you feel your collegiate experience differed from them positively and maybe negatively, and yet still have the confidence to think that this is maybe a career I can pursue? Yeah, I mean, I think... For, for me, it obviously in, in the negative aspect, you kind of have that devil, so to speak, in the back of your head, kind of saying exactly what you did. Oh, these girls go to ACC schools, Big Ten schools. But I think at the same token, um, I don't want to say it humbled me, but I think I always had this um, need to then co constantly work hard to prove myself, to prove that I did belong. Um, so I think it challenged me in that way. Um, also, because I thought my work rate was good. Well, you better take it up 10 notches because everyone here works hard. Um, and I think for them, um, in the way it could negative impact them potentially is um, maybe just not having as much I don't want to say competitive spirit, but need or desire to improve. Um, but I think they quickly figure that out once, you know, we're all competing for a roster and um, going head to head on um, an 18 person roster. Can you reflect back on the day you found out you were going to make the team? Um, yeah, so I was actually in Chile, just finished up the Junior World Cup and I had signed up to go to the tryout in January and Yannicka Schottman at the coach, we were, it was the coach at the time of the U21 team. And we were having our um, debrief of the whole tournament, our individual conversation. And um, she kind of said like, do you want to make, do you want to make the national team? She had just been appointed that the head coach. And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> And, um, she was like, okay, like you, I'm going to pull you up. Um, it's going to be a lot of hard work. I can't promise you any playing time. Um, I don't even know if you're going to, you know, do well, but I, you know, I'm willing to give you that opportunity. And, um, here I am today on the national team a couple of years later. So talk about what, what does that mean for a field hockey player in terms of contracts and uh, is there an agent involved or are you your own agent? And, and what does it mean in terms of trying to earn a living doing this? Uh, tell, talk us about the aspects of being a professional in this sport. Yeah. So um, kind of once you make the team, you reach out to a sponsor and um, from a stick sponsor and you kind of negotiate that on your own. Um, and then from there kind of sponsorships, I don't want to say end, they definitely could continue if you continue to pursue them. Um, but you don't necessarily have an agent, or at least I don't. And I don't believe any of my current teammates do. 
But from there, you join this full-time program where we train five days a week when we're not in lockdown or at home. Um, and you, you receive a stipend from USA Field Hockey and then from the USOPC. So it is a full-time program um, and it is our full-time job. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of, you jump right in and this becomes your life. You forced me to do a little research on, on field hockey itself. I didn't know the term cap uh, yeah. in field hockey. Uh, I did find out, of course, that uh, it means a player's appearance. So let's mm -hmm. talk about your first cap as a, uh, uh, as a U.S. player. Yeah, so that was super exciting. It was, I think, like a week after graduation. So right after graduation, packed up all my stuff, was down to Lancaster, moved into my apartment and was practicing with the team literally the next day. Um, and then a week later, I was, I was playing my first game and we played against Ireland at home, which I was pretty happy that I got to experience that at home. Cause my parents got to be there. Um, and Jennifer also came, which was super cool. Um, just because if it obviously was abroad, you wouldn't um, have that support group. So I was super lucky and, and excited to have them there. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So that's one of the centers of field hockey. Yep. That was where we um, used to train full time at. Currently, we're in the process of getting a new facility. So mm -hmm. you have hit a 50th cap milestone. Talk about that. 50, 50 uh, competitions. Yeah. So um, I got to, again, experience my 50th cap at home, which I don't think a lot of people uh, do that, where they experience both big milestones um, on U.S. soil, which was pretty cool. I It was in the Dome at the Nook. Um, we played Belgium. We, uh, I think we lost, but it was still, it was super cool. Um, and it was, it was funny. I sat down with, again, my coach at the time, Yannicka Schottman, and she was like, you know, 50, that's awesome. She's like, I didn't feel comfortable playing international hockey till I got to a hundred. And I literally just like laughed in her face and was like, yep, I, I, you know, I hope I start feeling comfortable at a hundred, but. Um, those two people yeah. on screen look pretty proud of you. What'd you say? The picture on the screen, uh, those two people look very proud of you. Oh yeah. Those are, those are my parents. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell that they uh, they are very proud of their daughter. Yeah. All right, you go on to an Olympic qualifier and you don't mess around, you score two goals. Yeah, so that was a very exciting moment, but also super tragic. Um, so for those who don't know, the way the Olympic qualifier works for field hockey this year was, or in the lead up to the 2020 Olympics, was um, a two game series against a team that was, at random and we drew India. So we flew all the way to India to play two games um, in the hopes of qualifying for the Olympics. And in the first game, we went down 5-0 or 5-1. Um, and we had to, we had to, it was the winner of an aggregate of both games. So we had a big, big, job ahead of us for game two and we came out guns a blazing um ended up scoring four goals so with a 5-1 um score line in the first game and 4-0 we were currently tied um with aggregate score which would mean if the game had ended we would go into shootouts um unfortunately that didn't happen um india scored within the last i think seven minutes of the game um and ended to take them to the Olympics. Um, but yes, I got to score two pretty nice goals um, in that game. And I think for me, looking back on that game, I still look back with fond memories um, just because I think most people looking at game one would kind of have, you know, laid over and died game two. And we came out losing all expectations of, um, you know, what would happen and didn't put any assumptions on ourselves, but rather 
as my coach said, um, we kind of looked at, at up at a mountain and said, we're going to start climbing and we'll find out where we end up. So um, I, I think we did that. And I'm pretty proud of, of that performance and that team that came out game two. Ready to no play. question about it. It's uh, just a shame that you weren't able to make the, uh, the Olympic, uh, didn't qualify for the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, one thing though, you've alluded to here, you go to India to play and You've gone to a lot of great places to play field hockey, Peru, England, South Africa, New Zealand, Argentina, Ireland, Australia. Uh, I mean, you have to have great memories from all those countries you visit. Yeah, it's super, it's funny whenever people um, find out that you're going to a new country or you have um, a flight somewhere, they'll be like, oh, do you get to visit all these places, get to go to this tourist location. And realistically, we don't. Um, a lot of times we go to the hockey pitch and go home um, to our hotel. But we also do get to see the countries in a very different light, which I kind of appreciate. I appreciate the fact that we don't always go to a specific tourist site, but we get to kind of almost like live um, I don't want to say as locals, because some places we do, some places we don't, but we kind of get immersed into um, the culture in terms of like the food and getting to meet people and understanding different cultural customs and stuff like that. Um, so it is pretty cool to see and um, visit these countries and get that experience. Um, and I do have very fond memories of, of, all of the countries for different reasons. Um, you know, Netherlands, we got to stay in a hostel and um, we get to ride bikes like we're locals and go to different coffee shops. In New Zealand, we our hotel has been on the beach, which has been amazing. Um, and even in India, we're eating naan bread and I'm learning what naan bread is. And um, it's, it's super, super cool to just immerse yourself into all of these places. Is there a place you definitely want to get back to? Um, I like them all. I My favorite would probably be the Netherlands, just because I love the fact that they ride bikes everywhere. I think that's so cool, and I wish we could somehow manage to do that in the U.S. <laughs> Before we get to the questions and answers, um, I, I did want to talk to you just a little bit about what Jennifer alluded to in your introduction. Uh, where you took the time to talk to the players, and I'm sure uh, you're an ins inspiration to a lot of young girls. Uh, is there a message you'd like to, to pass on to, to any young girl who has just wants to play athletics, just wants to play sports, just wants to do well academically? Uh, what, what message do you have for them? Yeah, I think um, with whatever you do in, in life, it's kind of embracing the uncomfortable opportunities that you face. Um, and then knowing that nothing's gonna happen overnight. Um, I know I talked with um, the Lafayette girls about this, but it's, your successes are a reflection of everything you do every day. So I talked to them about this concept of marginal gains that, I'm not going to develop a skill or become president tomorrow. But if I put in the actionable steps and do my best each day to get better, then over time, I will accomplish whatever goal that I have set out. Um, but to understand nothing's gonna happen overnight. Great message for anybody, uh, mm -hmm. for certain, and way to get your accomplishments accomplished. Uh, I think too, before I get the Q and A, I think we have to pat, uh, maybe literally, Max on the on the back. Uh, you have yourself a golden doodle, a miniature golden doodle, mm -hmm. and uh, he has just been terrific. He didn't jump up on the table. He didn't. <laughs> yeah, he's been pretty good. He's been laying down. He's getting a little fussy now. Come here, Max. Come here. <laughs> come on. Here he comes. Come on. Everyone's Amanda, waiting for you. Amanda was worried that he might do some barking and things yeah. like that during the interview. He there was perfect. He's still perfect. Yeah, you're on I have a, I, Amanda, I have a question from Kate Arnold. Okay. Uh, she, she played with you, right, as a goalie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she's the current chair of the Friends of Lafayette Field Hockey. Amanda, she says you have to tell everybody a little bit more about your super fan mother. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. She's well. So now that Kate says that the number one memory I have of her is I think it might've been Halloween and she wore like an angel angel wings. Um, and we won that game. And so she decided that every game after she was also going to wear her angel wings. And so she was an angel in the stands. So that's, I guess, a little insight into my mother. I guess there's a message there too, for everybody. Uh, most people are successful because they usually have a lot of support behind them. And I know you made mention to that to me earlier about mm -hmm. your mom and dad. Yeah, they've been so supportive from, you know, when I was little to now, and they've always pushed me to be better and um, kind of know when I can take a little more push and when I need that support, so. So you're where in your life right now, 2017, you graduate. It's now 2020, three years into being a professional hockey player. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think the next five years are going to be before you? And if eventually you have to get out of field hockey, uh, what, what's next for you in your life path? Well, COVID taught me not to make plans, but I, I think... I hope that field hockey is in my future for the next four, at least, if not more, but we'll see. Um, and then after that, I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, I kind of mentioned to you earlier, but I did have my real estate license in, in PA. So maybe I'll get into that. Maybe I'll get into coaching um, at the collegiate level or open a club of my own. Um, I don't really know, but it's kind of exciting not to know. Well, we also have an exciting guest. Uh, Bill Rappel is with us. He has been watching and he has a camera that he'd like to ask all, uh, on camera. He has a question he'd like to ask on camera. Here's Bill. Right. First of all, I really thought you uh, were fluent in Spanish. <laughs> you no. should have covered for me. <laughs> my, my, both my parents are. So if you've talked to my mom or heard her, she definitely yes. is fluent. Okay. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> And I'll tell you uh, just just a very quick story. I think you were in, at the Nook at playing an under twenty one tournament. It might have been the same tournament you had talked about. Mm -hmm. And I was standing next to Missy Mahar, who is the head coach at Maryland. And I said, "Look at that girl down there. She's she's going to be really good. She's going to be an All American." Missy looked at you for about two minutes and she said, "How the hell did I miss her?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's super sweet. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of college coaches felt that way, uh, probably. <laughs> so so certainly hats off to Jennifer Stone. She didn't miss you at all. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And Bill, thank you so much for what you do for uh, field hockey at Lafayette. Wow. Um, it's become my favorite sport. <laughs> I have a question from uh, one of our uh, primetime part guests. In fact, our first one, Tom Ojakian. He wants to know how long were you in Tanzania? Did you train while you were there? Did that time away from the game concern you since many division one athletes aren't allowed the time to spend a semester abroad? Mm -hmm. um, so the first part, I, we were there for three weeks, I believe. Um, it was nice having Eliza there because we were able to train together. Um, and it actually was in our senior year. Um, so being field hockey, being a fall sport, we didn't have anything in the spring. Now for me, I knew at that point that I was going to be joining the national team. So I was concerned about that. Um, I obviously didn't bring my field hockey stick. I wasn't playing field hockey, but I did want to make sure I stayed in shape. Um, and funny story about that. We, we did run in Tanzania, but the air is so thin there that I close to had an asthma attack when, when we were training there. So fun fact. So you weren't going to go to the Boston Marathon from Tanzania, right nope. to the Boston Marathon. Nope. No, it wasn't going to happen. Any other thoughts before uh, we thank you so much for being with us? Um, no, just thank you guys for having me and reaching out. Um, I think Lafayette has had such a transformative effect on me, and I certainly wouldn't be where I am um, without not only Jennifer and the Lafayette field hockey team, but the whole um, Lafayette field hockey community, everyone, everyone from the athletic staff and administrators to the professors and everyone, everyone there. So. 
Amanda, we thank you so much for joining us. We want this COVID to be done with. You get back to that national team and uh, continue to score goals, not only on the field, but also in your life. So uh, thanks for spending time with us tonight. Yeah, thank you. That is Amanda Magadan, of course, uh, our primetime part guest for this evening. I do want to remind everybody just a couple of announcements. There is a Lafayette Sports Network Game of the Week uh, that is on every week. And uh, you can simply go to the link uh, to pick that game up. Uh, certainly well worth revisiting some of the great games uh, from Lafayette's past. Uh, Lafayette is also celebrating 50 years of co-education. Uh, that link, too, is available to you to go back and take a look at that. Uh, and certainly, uh, as always, you know, go on goleopards.com and you can find all of this information. And there is a Show Your Spots campaign uh, where uh, a donation will get you a leopard mask. We all are masked these days. Why not uh, show your support for Lafayette by wearing a Lafayette mask? I would like to let you know that we do have another primetime part coming up November 19th at 8 o'clock. Brad Purcell, class of 95, senior vice president of media and game schedule for Major League Soccer. He will be our next guest on primetime parts. Again, I thank Amanda. I thank Jennifer, certainly Sharita Freeman and everyone involved, uh, Brian Ludroff, Scott Morris, for putting this all together. We hope you enjoyed our chat with Amanda Magadan. I know I have. I'm sure you have. And for that, I'll say go Leopards. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.